Please take your seat. Okay, it's, um, let's start the final uh, segment uh, of uh, this day. Uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that uh, uh, I introduce to you the, our keynote speaker. Uh, our keynote speaker is one of those speakers that uh, actually do not need an introduction. It's Bruce Sterling, science fiction writer and journalist uh, and uh, newly acquired uh, uh, citizens of Torino, almost. <laughs> and uh, Bruce, when we asked him uh, whether he was interested to listen to our conversations uh, about internet governance, uh, whether he was in interested in uh, providing a feedback in his own unique way, he said immediately yes, and we were deeply grateful. We are grateful for his availability. He was also involved in the Maker's Fair in Rome um, as we speak, but uh, uh, he left the Maker's Fair to be here with us, so thank you so much for being available. And uh, uh, he is the final speaker of the day. After him, I will always only say thanks uh, to all of you, so uh, please join me in welcoming Bruce Sterling to the podium. Thank you. take too much of your time. Obviously, you're a wonderful cocktail party ready to start here. <clears throat> yeah. uh, happy to be here, and thanks for that introduction. So, um, uh, yeah, you're, it's nice to have such an, an intimate gathering here, and I'm, I'm like keen to join the cocktail party. And I know you have a lot to say to one another. Uh, but, uh, you know, I came here, and I, I did see your presentations, and they were quite interesting. So, uh, I'm gonna play inside your frame. So, you know, it's about evolution, evolution of internet governance. So uh, here's an evolution frame. This is uh, the famous uh, Cambrian explosion of a species. This is the Burgess Shale. So this is what the early internet was like. This is full of like weird, squishy creatures. And uh, they had kind of brief lifespans and most of them are extinct now. But you know, I, I'm old, so I was there. Uh, so you, you might ask, okay, is, is evolution the right word for what happened in this kind of early internet day? I mean, the internet's a generation old now, and it's gone into a lot of different, species, uh, different spaces. Maybe you know, invasive species would be a better metaphor, because they've sort of broken the aquarium here, and here are the, uh, you know, the eccentric creatures which have now grown to monstrous 
size, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, hundreds of millions of users, colossal amounts of money, tremendous political influence, global expansion, nobody ever expected them to come from anywhere, young, freaky, monstrous, colossal, and there's Huawei, Samsung, Intel, these other guys. I mean, if you look at the aquarium, right, the evolved aquarium, and you kind of like describe, okay, what are the creatures in the aquarium, and you're a novelist like myself, well, basically there's five big frogs in the aquarium, five really, really big frogs, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon, and there's some pond scum, which are kind of like single-celled creatures floating around in their millions, diatoms, plankton, those are the users. And there's parasites who are criminals. And there's lots and lots and lots of them. And then there are various half-hidden secret predators, which are cyber war groups, subversives, uh, you know, uh, operations other than war, this kind of stuff. You know, that, that's kind of the state of the ecosystem. I would not describe it as a healthy ecosystem. It's actually quite spooky. And, you know, why is it like that? Well, you know, here's what's happening in the world of screens. It's like we had a president here complaining that the students are all on cell phones. It's true that the students are all on cell phones, but everybody's students are on cell phones. In fact, the entire population's on cell phones. And you can see how they're dividing up their time. Now, in the early days of the Internet, it was all about the desktop machine and your cable that ran off to the National Science Foundation backbone somewhere in EDU land, or you might have been .mil, or you might have been .org. But, you know, in the pre-dot-com days, it was all the green part there, you know, as like TVs and laptops. And now the yellow, the golden smartphones are basically eating everything, and the tablets have a piece. You can see, you know, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, you can see, like, the Yankees really love TV still because, you know, they make a lot. And the Italians kind of like moseying along right at the bottom there as the Italians like reading paperback novels, listening to vinyl records. They're kind of great, actually. I mean, you know, Italian students actually have less smartphone menace than, uh, you know, the Indonesians who for some reason are absolutely living off screens now. <clears throat> so, you know, what does this mean? Well, you know, it's a, it's a technical shift, and it's a shift in the nature of the Internet. It's, uh, you know, team cable. Cable providers mean a lot more. Uh, wireless providers mean a lot more. Um, operating systems for handheld devices mean a lot more. Android is more important. iOS is more important, dominant even. And it's, uh, you know, it's disingenuous to think that the older Internet would preserve its values under this completely different technical regime. Oh, that's just how things have developed. I mean, that's how the situation has actually evolved. And, uh, you know, we're not stuck on cell phones by accident. Just got all kinds of cell phones. And all kinds of new people have arrived since the early 90s. I mean, look at these swarms of new entries. I mean, not just millions, hundreds of millions of people. Colossal demographic shifts. How would you expect the early Internet not to evolve but this, you know, huge, hugely new amount of just pure biomass here. You know, and once again, Italy, not all that big. The boot of Italy actually kind of disappears here. Well, I guess you can see it. There's Sardinia. But, you know, this, this is an ongoing transition. And pieces of this stuff are not really internet anymore, like the China Great Wall, firewall of China is not really internet. And the uh, RuNet, is, uh, Russian net, is also aiming very much for Russian information sovereignty now and kind of deliberately cutting connections to the, to the global internet. So you just see a new globalized world of internet users and just information service users of things that used to kind of be internet. I mean, this is the ocean entering the aquarium, as someone was making the elegant metaphor earlier. Like, yeah, the aquarium walls are down, and look at all the fish. Lots. Okay, people quite keen on ecosystems here. This is an ecosystem. It's like a commercial ecosystem for the Internet of Things, which is like my new hobby horse. And I really like Internet of Things because I always thought the Internet would eventually move into physical domination of the world. And, uh, you know, I, I always wondered what that would look like, and now I've lived long enough to actually see it kind of happening. 
So, you know, you're, 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 you're speaking to one another here. It's like, okay, we've got to understand the ecosystem. I, I understand this. This is a small fraction of the ecosystem. I frankly don't understand it. I mean, I did not arrange this chart, of course. I merely found it. But I spent a lot of time looking at it, and a number of the players in it are already dead. Uh, the way it's organized doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, this is kind of a business analyst thing. It's all about silos, kind of. I mean, why is IBM small and in the corner when a tiny outfit like Arduino down here in the, in the very bottom is somehow it's equivalent? And yet this is the best chart I have found to just kind of map what's going on and what might, one might call the Internet of Things ecosystem. And, you know, I'm really spending a lot of time studying this. I mean, it's just a fantastic spectacle, an epic struggle. This isn't the half of it, but this is the best map I've found. And what does that mean about evolution of the internet? Well, you know, this is internet governance moving into other spaces here. I mean, internet governance of your lifestyle, internet governance of your heartbeat, internet governance of your breathing rate, internet governance of your quantified self, your family, your fitness, your wearable devices, internet governance of your connected homes, your light switches, internet sewage, is what this means. Internet industry, internet manufacturing, the industrial internet with the building blocks on the bottom and you know the heavy players up at the top. These are internet governance models which are being exported into everything else we're doing, everything with a switch, everything with a faucet, smart city streets, traffic lights. They're taking the models that were refined by the big five, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon, and methodically applying them in everything else we've seen. Okay, you know, if you're into internet governance studies, I mean, this is like the frontier. Rather horrifying frontier, actually. Uh, you know, and then there's stuff like this, which I actually like quite a lot. I mean, this is an issue map, which I saw at your event here, and I immediately copied it. You know, and, and, and it, 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 you know, it struck my heart because it looks like an unwritten science fiction novel. I think I could easily write a novel that had all these things going in it. I mean, it just looks kind of like a screenplay to me. And, and as a, you know, a literary creative, I find this kind of analysis really nice. You know, and I, and I like that, that people in your group do things like this and take it seriously because this is kind of like using network theories to study networks which is, I think, great, because it's like fighting wildfires by lighting backfires, right? Just like, we're gonna like destroy it before you can reach us, you know, we're like, we're like save certain areas. Okay, you know, I, I like this, I adore it even, I don't take it tremendously seriously, and you know, it's because I've seen it done. I mean, if you hang out with like digital humanities people, they like to bring these up. And as a novelist, when you like talk to digital humanities guys, they usually come up with some kind of gesture or motive like, oh, Mr. Sterling, I mapped all the words in your 13 science fiction novels and I've got like a great Bruce Sterling word crowd, uh, cloud here. And, you know, and this somehow implies that I understand you better than you understand me. You know, and my immediate response to that is not, oh, thank you for enlightening me. On the contrary, it's like, oh, that's great. I'm gonna put you in one of my novels as a figure of fun. I'll see to it that you're humiliated and broken on the rack of public mockery. Okay, so that's actual power struggle in this kind of analysis. And I think it's very typical of culture war in the 2020s. I mean, not this in particular, but the kind of my model disrupts your model. Like my model is a higher level of analysis than your model. And I think you see that everywhere. I mean, it's, it's kind of the key to a lot of our struggles. I mean, people will happily die for their models. They're even like embracing models that they know are factually untrue just because they see them as powerful models. And this is something we do that we don't, we didn't used to do, but you do a lot of it because you're really kind of an avant-garde of this lifestyle. And, and what is it that you want to do? Well, step one, evidence-based analysis, which I think is great. I mean, you're scholars, you want to go out there actually like get up to stuff, start quantifying it, study it, 
you know, mix with the people there, do a little design analysis, economics, anthropology, whatever it takes, you know, get the, get the database together and have it actually connected to objective reality in some falsifiable way. Okay, I'm 100% with that. I'm a journalist myself, I understand that. Number two, you want to break your silos instead of unite on the same web page. We've got to like, okay, we've got to like resolve our inner difficulties and kind of like get all our centers of network study into sort of one network mega center of network mega study. Okay, great idea, makes perfect sense. Number three, drag the outside actors into your platform and make them recognize the legitimacy of your insights. Absolutely. How could you do one and two and not attempt three? You have to do that. And, you know, and I understand your means, motives, and opportunities, and I like sympathize completely. The great idea, you know, good luck. I would point out that even a literary movement of ten guys would have a very hard time doing that. I mean, first you want to talk about something nobody ever talked about before, evidence-based analysis. Then you want to like get the guys in your group to sort of get a publisher, hang out a lot together, talk about the same topics, generational sensibility and all that, great. And then like win an audience and become sort of major cultural figures and get lots of literary awards and all that sort of stuff. Okay, same structure. It's not easy. Why isn't it easy? There's too much diversity of opinion and the incentives and constraints are not equally distributed. The guys in the literary group don't actually want the same things from one another. They happen to be on the same page temporarily, but eventually they're going to blow up and go off into all directions. What's going to happen to you? Well, you know, you've like stuck your, you've stuck your, your flag into the hill called Internet and Society, and Internet's eating society. There isn't any difference. Where are you going to go with your model imperialism? Model imperialism at work. What does the victory condition look like? I love this. This is the victory condition for the Internet of Things. Guy's at his home. Everything is homes on the Internet. He's pitifully bored. No sense of wonder. He's not thrilled. It's not high tech. The human condition is one. He can't leave his apartment. He's staring morosely out the window. It's like, why don't you read a novel, fella? You know? <laughs> it's actually somebody I can help, you know? Like, why don't you read this book? Maybe it'll cheer you up, you know? Well, you need some entertaining sarcasm in your life, yeah. You know, that's the victory condition. That's what happens after it really works. Here are the uh, Internet of Things industry players breaking up into cults or consortia. Internet of Things more or less dominated by consortia. And you can see the heavy operators moving up and down, they're kind of like putting down the old poker chips. There's Apple, who always does everything secretly by themselves. They're at the bottom. The All Seen Alliance, which is like Qualcomm's gang. The Internet Industrial Consortium, that's the NSA-friendly American Internet Industrial Complex. The Open Internet Consortium, Dell, Intel, you know, some thread group, that's Google. It's Google's sock puppet. Okay, what are they trying to do? Number one, they want to get some evidence-based killer apps, something of the Internet of Things that actually works. Number two, they want to win the standards fight, get everybody together on their platform. Number three, go out, conquer the entire world without mercy, everything. Internet of Things, everything. Russian things, Chinese things, Italian things, they don't care. Sicilian things, illiterate Kurdish housemaker, rug weaving, any freaking thing. Plenty of room in the IPv6 space. They're just going to name and number everything they could possibly get their hands on. Why do they behave like you? Well, it's because they're your fellow citizens. They're practicing the same schemes you do. I mean, they, they're your contemporaries, and they happen to have billions, and they're, they're heavies, you know, but they, they act just like you because they're your historical co-players. I mean, they're just kind of... Where are you coming from? Why do they think they're going to do it? Okay, I don't believe this. I see a lot of this. I certainly do not believe this chart. Not for a minute do I believe it. I would just point out that it's all about the Internet of Things, and it's all about home, transport, health, building, and cities. Okay, how many people in this room, and you're like scholars of Internet governance, how many of you thought you were going to be 
worrying about how to manage buildings. Okay, one guy, that's great, two, you know, it's like, great, you guys got to be the first ones to break off and flake off in that direction. Or cities, is like, oh, we've got to do smart city stuff. Like, what does Torino want us to do? Oh, there's a smart cities initiative. We're the Polytechnico. We better figure out how cities work. We've got a week. Health. Okay, you know, I thought the internet was all about cyberspace. It turns out it's all about my internal organs. Somehow I have to master that. Transport, okay, I don't have a car anymore. I could get, you know, whatever. You know, I'll have to use public, what I, they cut my funding. I have no car. And my home, this colossal invasion of the private space. Just moms on the internet, babies on the internet, grannies on the internet, there's a household robot in there, Google's on the wall, Apple's in the kitchen, Microsoft's coming through the window. No private space left whatsoever. Everything's swept to the wall. They think it's going to pay. They think it's going to pay. If it pays, they're going to drag you in their wake. Because that's where the internet's going. That's where they want to take it. That's where they see the new money. And, you know, what does this look like? This is, a, you know, a very typical science fiction techno-utopian solutionist thing going on here. I mean, I quite like this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up with this image because this comes from my cultural area of activity and uh, you know I see a lot of this and my I must say that my attitude toward images of this kind has evolved quite a lot I mean this is basically a science fictional image uh, it's an image of augmented ubiquity uh, obviously the ubiquitous computing is going on because this woman is completely surrounded by computational activity of some kind and her interface to that is this imaginary super wearable so, you know, there she is just kind of sopping up buckets of data, whatever she's doing, cracking into systems, I don't know. Uh, she's surrounded by smart dust, and she's got a graphic front end kind of wrapped on her eyes and ears. And, you know, I've seen a lot of these things, and I know, what should your attitude toward this be? Well, you know, ideally your attitude is supposed to be Wow, how cool is that high-tech image? Won't somebody sell me one immediately? And, you know, for a lot of people, I think that's the reaction. But it's certainly not the reaction that I think the Academy should have. It's like, oh, I'm going to throw off my square hat and immediately go get the Lucite Google glasses. You know, I, I don't think that's going to suit you. I think what you need, what you want to think is something along the lines of... Um, you want, to, you want to actually hear this woman's problems, like, can you help me, professor? I seem to have a serious social and technical policy problem going on here. Because I'm sure she's got lots. She's got lots, you know, and no amount of lip gloss and luxury sports gear is going to relieve her of these things. Um, one should feel, I mean, I feel, a kind of sense of solidarity and even pity for these kind of stand-in images now, and you know, I, I look at them and I recognize that they're evolving toward, well, she's evolving toward this. But this, this, if she, they, this would actually be an advance for her because she doesn't even look out the window. I mean, what you see here is a young woman, a blindfolded young woman who is trying to deal with a world she never made. She's surrounded by machine-made perspectives created by other people. Uh, she's not finding any evidence, she's not doing any evidence-based original investigation of what's going on around her. And, you know, she's kind of a, sharing a universal problem that we have. And, you know, if you're complaining about your students outside on cell phones, this is the apotheosis of that. Imagine a classroom full of these women. Every one of them outfitted in these blindfolds and earplugs. How would they talk to one another? How could they have a reasoned discussion? How are they going to find anything? They're off and, you know, she's off in her shut down Internet of Things world here. Um, and, you know, that's, that's not what the university is supposed to do. I mean, this is not what Academy gives to young people. This is a young woman and she could easily be a student. I mean... Young people in the academy now are extremely put upon. They're not glossing around in fine clothing with super advanced devices. They have devices, but 
I mean, there's 900 years of intellectual tradition in the academy. You don't want to, like, ditch that merely in order to pump colored images against this young woman's eyeballs. It really seems like kind of a cheat. And, you know, the evidence-based thing about young people in the university would suggest that their primary experience is suffering and dread as they suffer in the school because they're like being placed in debt and then they dread getting out of the school because they realize they'll be unemployed and at the mercy of oligarchs who, you know, dominate the economic situation. So, you know, that makes college actually a kind of physical place in which to gather and shelter precious young people, which is something that is not happening in this image. She's not finding any friends or any help or a sympathetic ear here, on the contrary. They are a revolutionary generation, but they're crushed by reaction. I've lost track of the number of failed youth revolutions in the past, you know, half dozen years since the crisis. There was the Arab Spring of Tahrir Square, where everybody had a cell phone, Twitter, and Facebook. They ended up kissing the feet of the secret police after a completely failed democratic civilian government. There was Kiev. I went to the Euro Maidan. They went out to the streets, demanded new elections, you know, wanted to abrogate a treaty. They succeeded in doing that, immediately lost two huge chunks from their country and had a civil war, which may flare up again at any time. There's Hong Kong. I don't think that will end well, frankly. And then there's Italy, which had the M5S, the, you know, Movimento Cinque Stelle. And if you want internet as governance, I mean, internet as government, people from the internet actually attempting to take over a government and run a government on internet principles, you've already given it a try. I mean, you've got them in your parliament. Like a 30-year parliament was actually democratically elected, which is more than Egypt could say, or Kiev could say, or Hong Kong could say, or Scotland, or, or uh, you know, uh, Barcelona either, as far as that case. I mean, Italy is one of the few democratic polities, which has actually found a group of this kind and managed to metabolize it somewhat. So, you know, if you look at the state of internet governance, it actually looks a lot like Italian government, frankly. It looks much more like Italian government than it has ever looked like Geneva, where people go to sort of like come up with global solutions. Forget it, that's not what's going on. It doesn't look like Berlin, where things are sort of well-organized, thrifty. No. Looks like Rome, it's kind of Catholic, universal. Everybody somehow thinks it's always like Vatican City, kind of a lot of priesthood in there, but surrounded by this vast, thriving mass of immigrants, thieves, tourists, weirdos. It looks like Rome. And, you know, I learn a lot about the Internet from my experience of Italian civil society, believe it or not. I mean, they're, they're not always pretty lessons. And, you know, I, I saw a recent interview with the great designer, Italian designer, Gaetano Pesce, famous 70s radical architect, who currently lives in New York. And he was interviewed in the latest issue of Architectural Digest, and they naturally asked him, Gaetano, why are you living and working in New York? And he says, well, you know, I, I love Italy, but I can't bear to go back there and watch them do that to themselves which is a very sad and morbid statement for, you know, an Italian patriot and a great Italian creative figure, except that I feel exactly the same way about Texas. It's like, why am I hanging out in Torino? Why am I, like, in Austin? You'd be protesting against, you know, the many iniquities of my extremely right-wing government. No, I, I know exactly where Gatano is coming from. I sympathize with him deeply, you know. I, 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 I had a, like a, a, you know, a moment of brotherly solidarity with this great man, and it really made me feel good. Uh, you know, and, and I hang out with Nexus Center, not because I can contribute very much. I actually enjoy seeing your enormous, big, arcane problems, world-scale problems, which are not really my problems. Because, you know, I'm not from around here. And I find them refreshing. You know, it's like a parade of elephants. There's something gorgeous about it. I mean, it's like a very, very big aquarium. It's bigger than you think. I mean, because you're internet people, you're, you're 
you're used to thinking of the inter as, as the internet as a kind of complicated, small technical aquarium thing where you had to keep the oxygen going so the fish didn't die. No, it's, that's not what happened. It, it actually looks more like this. I mean, this is your actual ecosystem here. It's like the, the wild ecosystem breaking into a nice Turinese apartment. And this happens to be a Turinese artist here. This is a cartoon by Dal Sani, who was a Turinese sat satirist of the 1880s and 1870s. He had a show downtown in the uh, Risorgimento Museum. And of course, I went there. I was hugely impressed. He's a super Turinese guy because there's some kind of joke on the wall that nobody will ever understand, you know. I, L, some mass, a chain that, that meant something once. God only knows what it means now, but I, you know, I completely get it about this. This is, you know, the internet of things coming through the door. This woman is not this woman, the early adopter, the young digital native. This is like Italian civil society. Watching enormous hairy monsters come out of the flaming forest to sit down right in the damned living room. That's what's actually going on, you know? And I think she's up to it, you know? She looks to me like a pretty together woman, you know? I think she's seen worse, probably. You know, with any luck, she'll have the bears drinking tea, you know? She'll, like, sit them up, give them a demi-toss. They might be just fine. But, you know, this is sort of the evidence-based situation, in my opinion. I mean, his work is on display downtown. There's something prophetic about it. Good luck with that situation. I mean, this is the situation you're really facing, I think. Take a selfie. I mean, that's what she ought to do immediately, in my opinion. Just have to, like whip out the old handheld. You know, I look bears. Click, click. You know, that was just. It would be fantastic on Tumblr. We should get tremendous social. Social media traction there. She just took a selfie of herself with the bears. Send some email. You know, this is, this is the bottom-up factual situation on the ground. That's how it really works. We will learn by this experience. It will be edifying. It will be educational. But it is what's happening. So, uh, you know, thanks for your attention, and let's go have a drink. So, my friends, thank you to Bruce Sterling for this keynote. And uh, I knew it was going to be horribly difficult to take the podium after him. So we'll keep it uh, very simple. And uh, the first thing I want to do is um, a big list of uh, thank yous. So first of all, let me thank the institution that uh, hosted us and supported us, which is the Polytechnico, the technicians at the back. Uh, uh, following us all day with lights and uh, with the uh, screens and everything. So thank you to the Politecnico, thank you to the Compagnia di San Paolo, which has given us a grant uh, to be able to coordinate the network of centers for the next two years. Thanks also to AGID, the Autorità per uh, uh, l'Agenda Digitale in Italia, che ha dato suo patrocinio, the patronage for this meeting. Uh, and then finally, non-institutional but personal thanks uh, uh, first of all, let me thank the, our friends at the Berkman Center at Harvard that uh, helped us to organize this meeting and came us uh, and uh, actively participated also to the program. Thank you so much. And thank you to our friends from the Humboldt Internet Institute uh, uh, that helped us uh, as for not only for this event, but also for two years. They were the first, uh, the founding coordinators of the Network of Centers and great friends. Thank you so much. And finally, let me thank uh, uh, the team at the Nexa Center. Uh, some of them are here in this room, I, Luca, Giuseppe, and the others. But let me also uh, thank uh, the persons that participated in the program, like Raimondo or Elena. And then uh, uh, let me mention her as uh, uh, last uh, because of the great role she had, Selena, that uh, she was, uh, she's still downstairs and she interacted with so many of you in order to make this event happen. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, so.
One final word, uh, we started with the framing of uh, Urskas, so we heard about the case studies, we heard about the projects, we thought about uh, uh, the role of academia in this uh, monstrous uh, aquarium that we heard about. Uh, we found, uh, we told to each other what the network of centers, what position, what stance it takes and what it aims to do. And um, we are going to keep working on uh, internet governance, so uh, let's keep in touch through social media, through direct contacts with uh, our respective centers and with the uh, website of the network of centers. Uh, but let me conclude not with science fiction, but with uh, a quote that I actually heard for the first time when I was at the Berkman Center, something much more classical than science fiction, which is Walt Whitman, because I think there is a, a famous poem by him that captures uh, the difficult uh, role that uh, uh, we are trying to take as academics, uh, being observers and evidence-based, but at the same time trying to swim in these dangerous waters, and the lines are uh, looking with side curved head, uh, curious what will come next, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it. Thank you.